Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. God loves you. Let nothing separate you from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus. Get that one. God loves me. I'm not going to go around that mountain again. God loves me. When I make a mistake, I'm forgiven. There's no condemnation. I receive the forgiveness for my sins. I shake off the condemnation. I go right on. I'm not wasting my time with that anymore. The title of the message tonight is Wonderfully Made. Because the Bible says that you and I, all of God's children, are wonderfully made. Can everybody say, I am wonderfully made? Now say it once like you really mean it. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you are wonderfully made. Now, you know, David, who started out as a shepherd and became a king, he, he, was, he was pretty bold when it came to saying some positive things about himself. He called himself the Lord's anointed. Now, I don't know how far we'd get today if we walked around, I'm the Lord's anointed, but, you know, we do need to know that we are the Lord's anointed, and to really begin to realize how phenomenal it is to say that you're the house of God and that God lives in you. I mean, that just pretty much just amazes me every time I think about it. And in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13, he said, For you did form my inward parts. You did knit me together in my mother's womb. I will confess and praise you, for you are fearful and wonderful, and for the awful wonder of my birth, wonderful are your works, and that myself knows very well. Now, he's talking about God's creation. He's talking about really how God has created people, that God is wonderful, and the work that he's done is wonderful. And then he said, wonderful are your works, and he's really talking about himself. So point to yourself and say, what God has done right here is wonderful. <laughs> I am wonderful. <laughs> hmm. Feels a little odd, but you'll get used to it. My frame, verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret and intricately and curiously, I love that, curiously. You ever feel like you're kind of a curious creature? <laughs> like a little bit, hmm. You know, I used to think I was weird. Now I just know I'm unique, and there is a difference. <laughs> you know? But I think most of us go through a season in our life where we just feel like there's nobody else like us, that we're just the weirdest, oddest, most unusual thing out there. And the devil works overtime trying to help us with all those thoughts. But when we have a relationship with Christ and we read the Word, we need to come to a point where we don't think like that anymore and we don't talk like that anymore because if, if you're not going to have anything decent to say about yourself, don't think that anybody else is ever going to. Matter of fact, you need to know so strongly who you are in Christ that even when other people talk negatively about you that you just don't believe them because you believe what God says much more than you believe what anybody else says. Amen? Has anybody noticed that not everybody's going to be for you all the time, even though you'd like them to be? You know, it, it is statistically proven that 10% of people won't like you. So no matter what I do, there's always going to be a certain percentage of people that are not going to like me. And I can't stress over that percentage I got to first get happy about the fact that God loves me and then just trust him to give me favor with people and even come to the point where I just can actually say because of Christ in me that if somebody doesn't like me and don't want a relationship with me, then they're just missing out. Amen. 
And you need to be able to say the same thing. And you think, well, I mean, isn't that a little bit of a haughty attitude? Oh, no, I, I understand the dangers of pride. And trust me, I, I know what I'm not, but I do know who I am in Christ. Amen. And that's what changes your life. When you know full well what you're not in yourself, but at the same time, you know definitely who you are in Christ. Amen. I like to say, I'm an everything, nothing. I'm nothing in me and everything in him. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 15. Again, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret. And intricately and curiously, I like the intricately. God took a lot of time making you very specifically and very specially. And he doesn't appreciate it when we don't like what he did. I said he doesn't appreciate it when we don't like what he did. I remember a friend of mine many years ago, people in the crowd were invited to go up for prayer and she went up to the pastor and said, I just, I need you to pray for me. I just hate myself. I just hate myself. And he backed off and looked at her and he said, who do you think you are? She was expecting some pity. He said, who do you think you are? If God loved you so much, they sent his only son to die for you and to suffer like he did that you might be free. Who do you think you are to hate yourself? So we need to start seeing ourselves the way God sees us. And it's such a healing thing to begin to like yourself instead of being against yourself. And I know what I'm talking about because I spent a lot of my life not liking myself, but I'm rather fond of myself now. Not in a selfish, self-centered way, but I just finally figured out I got to be with myself all the time. There's never a moment in my life when I get away from me. I can't even go to the bathroom without me. I can't do anything without me. And so if I don't like me, I'm in serious trouble because I'm with me all the time. Of course, I've been sharing this for years, but I do believe that the root, the root of many of our other problems is that way down deep inside, people just don't like who they are. And tonight, by the grace and the mercy of God, I want to bring you through to a place of having peace with yourself. Now, in Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, I think Philemon is somebody we probably don't think about too much. But there he is, and he has something really important to say. Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. And I pray that the participation in and the sharing of your faith might produce and promote full recognition and appreciation and understanding and precise knowledge of every good thing that is ours in our identification with Christ Jesus unto his glory. So now I've been looking at that quite a bit and I've read it over and over and over and I'd like to just camp here and stay on top of it for about 20 minutes till you get it, but I really don't have to, time to do that. So let me just reiterate this. He's saying, look, I want you to recognize and appreciate and have a precise knowledge of all the good things that are in you. Gosh, you're excited. Wasn't that thrilling? Let me try that again. <laughs> now, you want me to know why you responded? I'll tell you why you responded that way, because this is something we're not used to. It's much easier for us to sit around and think about everything that's wrong with us. And the devil helps us with that. Starting very early, he helps us with that. You're not, you're not, you didn't, you didn't, you're not, you should have, but you didn't, and on and on and on. But he says, I want you to have precise knowledge and be very informed about all the good things that are yours and in you in Christ. This is not about 
you being wonderful in yourself. It's about you believing the Bible and saying, I am wonderful because Jesus paid a great price for me when he hung on that cross and bled and died when he suffered. And I'm going to start acting like I know who I am in him. I don't think we can even begin to, we, we cannot even begin to imagine what would happen in the world. I mean, I, I can't even fathom what would happen in one city if every person who says they're a Christian would actually get up and act like one. <laughs> well, but I'm not, but I can't, but I'm not, but I should have, but I didn't. You know, if I had time to go through all of Psalm 139, which I don't, I've got more message than I've got night. And so I had to start picking and choosing. But if you read all of Psalm 139 like you really believe it, I mean, the Bible says that God already knew everything we were going to do before we ever did it. He knows every thought we're going to have that we haven't even thought yet. He knows every word we're going to speak that we haven't even spoken yet. Every day of our life was written in his book before we were ever born. And so let me just say again, and I say it all the time, you are no surprise to God and neither am I. After God called me to do this or after he's called you to do whatever it is you're doing, if you're parenting or, or whatever it is, God didn't say, oh, no. Oh, my gosh, did I ever make a mistake? I had no idea you were like that. <laughs> Now, when God called me, plenty of other people thought he made a mistake. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. And they told me they thought it was a mistake. And you know, I, <laughs> I just finished editing a book that'll come out, I, I guess, maybe around Mother's Day next year, specifically for moms called The Confident Mom. And you know why? Because it just grieves me to see how many people have children and they're petrified that they can't raise them right. Can I tell you, if God gives you something to do, he gives you an anointing to do it. I mean, you couldn't have had any more dysfunctional parenting than I had. I mean, I had no idea what to do with babies. Zippo, zero. But you know what? I have four grown kids. They're all serving God. We all have great relationships. Did I do it all perfect? No. But my heart was right, and God helped me and brought me through things, and he'll do the same thing for you. Stop living in fear that you're always going to do the wrong thing. I said stop living in fear that you're always going to do the wrong thing. If God gives you something to do, he will anoint you to do it. But I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Well, just pray and whatever you think is right, take a step. If it's not right, you'll figure it out. <laughs> Try something else. Stay on track, Joyce. Okay. Thank you. You know, I have some strengths, and I thought just for fun I'd write them down. Because <laughs> we don't do this very often, and I want to challenge you to go home and write down some of yours. I'm very responsible. I mean, if you want a job done, you give it to me, and I'll do it. I really like to do things for people. That's just almost like entertainment to me. And considering where I came from and how stinking selfish I was, that's quite a compliment to God. I have a great deal of integrity. I believe in keeping my commitments. I believe in keeping my word. Now, there are times when I open my yap and say I'll do things, and I didn't really think it through first, and I have to go back with a little egg on my face and say, hey, you know what, I just, I need you to release me from that or forgive me, but by and large, I try to keep my word. I'm a good mother. I'm a good wife. I'm not a normal mother or a normal wife, but I'm a good wife and I'm a good mother. And so when you look at me, you got a new normal, but that's okay too. Amen? 
I take care of what God's given me. I exercise. I eat pretty good. I'm growing in godly character. You say, well, why are you telling us all the good stuff about you? Well, why not? <laughs> you need to sit down and tell somebody else some good stuff about you, too. You say, well, what's wrong with you? Well, we don't have time to go through all that. <laughs> Nor do I particularly feel like talking about it tonight because I'm here to talk about how wonderful we are, not about everything that's wrong with us. Come on, give God a big praise. I mean, just for tonight, could we get off of everything that's wrong with us for just a few minutes? The devil wants us to recognize and have precise knowledge <laughs> of every flaw and weakness that is in us. But God says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop thinking and talking about everything that's wrong with you all the time. You're no surprise to God. Do you ever think that you're a little bit curious, a little different from other people? Do you ever really wonder what God had in mind? <laughs> Have you ever made that silly statement, well, I think when God passed out this or that, I was in the wrong line. Anybody ever said that? I mean, I thought for years when God passed out voices, I got in the guy line. I didn't get in the girl line. I mean, I was pretty sure that I got in the wrong line. And, you know, we think, well, when God gave out this, I was in the wrong line. And when God gave out that, I was in the wrong line. No, you were in the exact right line, right where God wanted you. And just because something about you isn't like something about somebody else, or maybe something about you isn't like anybody else, <laughs> that's okay, too. That actually doesn't make you weird. It makes you unique, and something unique is more valuable than if it's just like everything else. Amen? When God called me into ministry, he purposely, and I, I don't have time to tell you all these stories, but I mean, I tried so hard to get around other preachers that were doing big things, and I wanted to watch them and see what they were doing and get advice from them and find out what they thought I should do about this and what they thought I should do about that. And I'm telling you, it became so obvious that that was not what God wanted for me. I'd make an appointment, it would get canceled. I'd show up and they wouldn't be there. I mean, I finally just thought, well, God, don't you want me to have any friends? <laughs> and then I began to understand, and Dave did too, that I was so impressionable at that point and insecure enough that I would have just followed along right after like a little puppy dog like somebody else. And God didn't want that. He wanted something new, fresh, unique, and he wanted to give me a word and a style of my own. And God wants to give you a style of your own, and you don't need to be like anybody else, nor do you need to apologize for being who you are. You're not an accident. God ordered every detail of your body he chose your race, your skin color, your hair color, the texture of your hair. He prescribed the details of your body shape and your height. He determined your abilities, your natural talents. He determined the time period that you would live in. You are not random. You are designed on purpose for a purpose. There's nothing accidental about you. You say, well, God couldn't have possibly designed my body or God couldn't have possibly done this or that. Well, I'm not saying that sometimes we don't let things get out of shape, but I am saying this. Basically, we are born with a bone structure. Just like your height, you don't choose how tall you're going to be or how short you're going to be. You don't get to choose how big your feet are or how small they are. There are certain things that we don't get to choose. And we, we all have a certain bone structure. And if you happen to be one whose bones are a little bigger, then because of our society and the body image that it portrays, you probably don't like it and you see some little skinny thing walking around and you think, oh. Now listen, I want to just kind of set this aside for just a second and I'm going to go over here and say a little something else to you that I'm going to talk to you more about tomorrow. Tomorrow. 
In Philippians chapter 1, Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus three very important things. He said, I want you to know God. Not know about God, but I pray that you would know God. Then he said, I pray that you would know your inheritance among the saints. Or the way I like to say it is, I pray that you would know who you are as a child of God. And then he said, I pray that you would know the power that's available to you who believe. Now, I have spent a lot of time in my ministry trying to teach people who they are in Christ. And I will certainly continue to do that. I want you to know tonight that God loves you unconditionally, perfectly. There's nothing you can ever do to get God not to love you. I do not care what you've done in your past. God loves you. I don't care how much of a stinker you've been. You could have been an especially wicked sinner, and God still loves you. Through a relationship with Christ, you can be completely forgiven, completely set free from past bondages. He really has no favorites, or actually everybody is his favorite. The Bible says that we're all the apple of his eye. When you really begin to find out what's yours in Christ, it gets so exciting you can't hardly stand it. We're made complete in him. We're perfected in him. We're justified in him. We're sanctified in him. Through him, we can do all things that we need to do. And I could take you to scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture, just telling you all these things over and over and over and over again. And I'm going to spend tonight doing my very best to get you convinced once and for all that you are wonderful. <laughs> and that although you have things wrong with you and I have things wrong with me, let me tell you a statement I've gotten a hold of recently and I really love it. There's a difference in wickedness and weakness. And I tell you, I've got some weakness, but I'm not wicked. And if you've been born again, you have some weakness, but you're not wicked. If you're here tonight, you are not wicked. Wicked people don't come to something like this. And so I want you to get that through your head. There's a difference in wickedness and weakness. And in case you haven't read it, the Bible says that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. His strength actually looks for weakness to flow through so he can show himself strong and people can look at you and say, well, when I look at the change in you, it's got to be God. When I look at what God's doing through you, it has got to be God because I knew you when. God chooses the weak and the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You know, I want to encourage you to start believing and saying what God says about you. Not necessarily what others say about you or even what you think yourself. You know, the Word of God trumps everything. His Word is truth and we need to learn how to speak the truth because truth will even supersede facts. So I've got a little homework assignment for you. I hardly ever give homework, so listen. I want you to get a piece of paper, sit down when you have time, and list your strengths. We all have things that we're good at as well as things that we're not so good at. Then begin to recognize and appreciate that God has designed you for a purpose. He has given you strengths, and the more you use those strengths, the more you're going to fulfill the purpose that God has for you. Stop focusing on everything that's wrong with you and begin to see how much good God has placed in you. You are made for more than what you probably think that you are. <laughs>